<laughs> and I'm going to turn the uh, the floor, as they say, over to Mr. Scott Gregory from MedAv Group. And um, I'm a very big fan of his. He doesn't like that, but I am anyway. We have 25 people here, counting you. Um, you have broken the bank. We of all our this is our 11th out of 12 sessions. We haven't had 25 people before, so. Welcome and thanks for being here, everybody. And type your questions when you have any or comments. Well, uh, welcome everybody, and, uh, and and thank you, uh, Denise. First of all, for inviting me to the uh, presentation here. I, it's uh, it's a wonderful idea to have this month long series, and I'm, I'm I'm glad to be a part of it. And thanks everybody for coming. Hope you're having a good uh, Thanksgiving week. A little weird these days, I know, but uh, hope you're getting through it. And uh, I guess uh, the topic today is kind of related to that weirdness. Uh, we're gonna to talk today about presenting your work and yourself virtually, making strong impressions on potential employers and clients. And the, this should take about 35, 40 minutes. And after that, I wanna open it up to questions, certainly and some interaction, and also wanna address some of the uh, survey questions that you were kind enough to uh, fill out for me a couple of days back. Appreciate that, by the way. I wanna start with an admission. It's an admission of guilt, I suppose, because I don't use Zoom or similar tools that often. But I certainly understand the value these days. It's an indispensable tool, uh, brings family and friends together, certainly makes business presentations more likely these days. So it's a great tool. I just happen to not use it that often, haven't had to. That said, it occurred to me that I think I've been uh, communicating with audiences virtually my entire career. Um, I spent 12 years in radio, on the air and in production. And I would sit in a studio in the center of town and my audience was all over the place. We were separated by distance. And then I transitioned into marketing. I've been here for again almost 30 years and everything we do here at Mad Ave Group is, is uh, conceived, strategized about, it's written, it's uh, recorded, edited, and then it's distributed through various channels all over the country. So now I have a, a gap with the audience of not only distance, but time. I could easily write a script in the first of the month and it may not see the light of day till the end of the month. So distance and time are kind of setting up a virtual kind of atmosphere here, just like we have with Zoom these days. So even though I don't have a lot of experience with Zoom, I think I can still apply a lot of the rules that I've picked up over the years and try to get you to see the value of them as it, as it applies to Zoom. So two ideas I want you to keep in mind. Number one, when you use Zoom for a meeting or a presentation, think about this, what are your goals? And not just the, not just the major goals, like I wanna win a client or I want, to, uh, I want to earn a job. The sub goals, how do you wanna be perceived during this transmission? What are the best ways to showcase your strengths? How can you differentiate yourself and make solid impressions? And that can be tricky when you're not in the room, when you're not able to shake hands and look people in the eye. Second idea is that of knowing your audience. What do they want from you or your company during this kind of communication? What can you offer them that they didn't expect? How can you add extra value? How can you surprise and delight your audience? What are their expectations from your presentation? Are you, are you talking to a, a, a major national brand that has an expectation of a shiny, highly polished audio video presentation? Or are you just talking to somebody who wants to have a simple conversation? Helpful to know that stuff before you, before you start preparing your content. In preparation for today's uh, get together, I asked Denise for a description of each class that would be represented here today. And through Denise, I also asked the instructors for their top three takeaways that they would like you, the students, to leave the course with. And I also prepared a quick survey to see how you felt about certain topics. In other words, I did some homework, a little research, right? Try to make the materials that I was going to bring to you today as relevant as I could. Anyway, that work, um, that type of research is especially important when you are in an interviewing situation, interviewing for a job. As somebody who has uh, had the opportunity to interview several people over the years, I, I, I need to tell you this. I am continually astounded uh, when uh, after an interview is just about over, uh, I ask uh, an applicant if they have any questions of me. And six times out of 10, the, the person will sit there and go, no, 
Really? You have no questions of me? No? Okay, so you're going to uproot your family, leave your current job, you're going to move to our town, you're going to find new schools for your kids, you're going to come to our building, you're going to come to this new culture, and you have not a single question for me, not about our culture, not about the health of our company, not about uh, our clients, about the day-to-day -day operations, you have nothing. That to me is a red flag when I'm talking with a potential employee, that, you, that you're not engaged enough to ask questions about where you're going to be, it shows you're not either engaged with your career or this process, or frankly, that you just don't care. And I'm not interested in, in folks who, who can't sum up a few genuine questions about, um, about their future. Makes sense to me. So apply those questions and that prep and that homework to when, you, when you're giving presentations or interviewing with folks. By the way, I mentioned, um, I think I mentioned the, uh, the, the takeaways that your instructors uh, provided, kind of narrowed the list to three of them. One of the takeaways that the, one of the instructors wants to impart is to be professional. The second is, how can I improve my presentation of me to make my interview or my presentation memorable and successful? And the third one is, soft skills are more important to your career than your current knowledge. If they like you, they will train you. If they don't like you, doesn't matter how much you know, you ain't getting the gig. Right, so those soft skills. And while we're talking about interview prep, interviewing via Zoom, of course, puts you and your, your contact or your, your other party at a disadvantage, right? No shaking hands, no genuine eye contact, no uh, body language that you can read. So your voice and your content really do have to carry the weight in that, uh, in that relationship. And that's why, again, it's especially important to prepare carefully for the interaction and know your stuff. Realize that a platform like Zoom or, or similar platforms can make you look kind of unimpressive, whether it's because of poor lighting or because it's a bad connection, bad audio, whatever it is. So you need to prepare to shine with your content and your personality and hopefully a smooth presentation as well. And speaking of the personality and energy, I want to talk about the importance of energy, especially in virtual presentations. Now, every once in a while, I get to work with uh, voiceover talent and whether it's professional folks or uh, sometimes we pull in uh, fellow employees from the office and ask them to do a, a voice or two. And when I get the chance to direct them, I might ask them for a little more energy or enthusiasm in the read. See, that is great, but give me a little bit more energy. So they do it again and they raise the energy level about 1%. Okay, that's great, let's do it again, but I need you to give me 50% more energy, really big, really excited. And we'll do another take and they give me 2% more energy. So I mention that because a lot of people don't necessarily know how low energy their presentation is. Now you put a camera between us and you put some, uh, some certainly some distance and uh, different environments. And sometimes that energy can be perceived as if it's, there's even less there. So you may need to uh, ramp up that energy quite a bit just to be perceived as having a positive vibe through that camera, right? If you're bored with the presentation, if you're not having fun, uh, then certainly your, your audience won't either. And one of the suggestions I make is to, is to go ahead and record yourself on your tablet or your phone and get a sense for how you appear on camera and how your energy level is and uh, can you ramp it up a little bit. So use, again, those tools that you have to prepare for this, this situation. More interview prep ideas. Uh, I want you to prepare several questions for your interviewer. I mentioned that earlier. Again, that shows genuine interest in the situation that you're in, whether it's an interview or uh, uh, you want to find out more about the company or the interviewer, him or herself, so important. It demonstrates that you've done your research too, that you've made an effort to get to know a little bit about this company. And that's certainly important when somebody's trying to hire somebody. They want to know that that person wants that gig. They want that job at that company, not just a job, right? And then finally, prepare two or three stories that communicate one, your character and personality. Two, the, the type of employee that you're going to be. Three, the times that you've gone above and beyond to help. Four, a success that you were responsible for. And five, uniquely in this day and age, a story about how you've distinguished yourself during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me plant this thought about the pandemic. These days, we have so many channels TV channels, movies, audiobooks, video games, websites, 
all sorts of entertainment options. There are so many options, in fact, that as a society, as a nation, we don't have nearly the common experiences that we did decades ago. 1964, February, I think, the Beatles are on Ed Sullivan. Everybody is watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. There's a legend, I don't know if it's true, I believe it's true, that the crime rate in New York City went down the night that the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan because everybody in the world was inside watching that program. July 69, the uh, first moon landing, everybody was watching that. 1974, President uh, Nixon resigns in August. Everybody was watching or listening to that. It had never happened before. We were having a communal experience via television and or radio. These days, those things are kind of hard to come by. Super Bowl, maybe something like that. But that's what's happening right now. That's what COVID is. It's a worldwide experience. All of us have this in common. Nearly everyone on the planet has been affected by this somehow, whether it's getting sick themselves, losing a loved one, being economically affected, just inconvenienced, they can't go to a restaurant, all those things. We are all experiencing this together. So anyone you interview with will relate to any good thing you've done in the wake of COVID. How have you responded? How have you moved the needle a little bit and in which way? Whether it's at work or for your family, your neighborhood, your church, your school, whatever it may be. What have you done to make a difference? Talk about that in your interview. Tell that story. Because anyone who's listening, anyone, will understand that. There's a commonality already as soon as you start to talk about that, and they can identify with that. I'm always wanting to um, present content that I can be proud of, that I personally like, that maybe has a different angle to it. Um, so that's kind of what I want to leave people with. So. What does your Zoom presentation or your online portfolio or your website say about you and your personal brand? That encounter that someone has with those things is a touch point like any other marketing or advertising touch point. And it's a chance for people to see how you handle big ideas, big concepts, as well as the little details that uh, have a cumulative effect. You can imagine, for instance, how, a, how an employer might respond if you show up in a uh, you know, a greasy t-shirt and cut off jeans and a tiger's hat. I mean, who would wear a tiger's hat ever when the Indians are so close by? Am I right? So understand that if you have uh, lazy mistakes or uh, take a careless approach to your Zoom presentation or your portfolio, any kind of online presentation, likely uh, it's going to be that uh, you leave a bad taste in some folks' mouths. It's just going to leave a bad impression. So let's get down to these basics that we're talking about here. I, I realize that some of the things that I'm going to mention right now to some of you are very basic. And if you're using these tips, following these tips, excellent. I need you to just bear with me for a while as we get through this list. But the reason I'm bringing these things up is I can't believe how frequently I see these kind of unwritten rules about presentations broken. So if you can, please consider using some of these ideas in your presentations. Number one, choose your background carefully. It should be clean and organized, not too much personal stuff back there, certainly nothing that's inappropriate. Uh, I don't personally care for the, uh, the Zoom generated backgrounds. They look like a bad green screen, so they look kind of tacky to me, but uh, consider choosing or creating a simple background that you can use during all of your presentations. Uh, it might have a, an image that supports your personal brand, your personal philosophy. Maybe it's an image that supports the theme of your presentation. But always try to keep it not too distracting so people focus on you rather than what's in the background. Light yourself well. Avoid shadows in your face. Consider buying one of those light kits that are available all over the place. They can either uh, attach to your laptop or be uh, on, a, on a tripod, that kind of thing. Uh, that way, when you have that type of light, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what the sky is like, you can light yourself well and uh, have a consistent presentation. Do not shoot into a window or any other light source. See this all the time. Make sure you're looking around or looking through your screen. There's no, no white hot light in back of you, no window, no shooting up into a lamp. Uh, it just does nothing for you as a subject. Choose a good camera angle. Seems a lot of people like to look down at the camera and we're looking up your nose or you get a nice double chin there. Or there's some odd shadows. So try to raise that camera level up a little bit so it's at eye level. It feels more like you're talking, shaking hands with somebody and having a real conversation as opposed to looking down on them. 
composition. Frame yourself nicely. And Denise and I have talked about this. There's a lot of headroom going on in America right now, an awful lot of headroom, just not necessary. This is where the emotion is right here, your eyes, right? If you can give you, I would rather have you cut your head off a little bit and leave more chest room here for hands and stuff. I know, I know somebody who tends to frame things like this and it's, it feels very claustrophobic. And then again, there are people who put their chin way in the bottom and they have all the ceiling in the world. So get yourself a nice composition where you can move your hands, you have talk space, you can turn your head a little bit, but the focus is right here in your eyes and in your mouth. That's where, that's where the action is, that's where the emotion is, okay? It, it's important to kind of assume the position that you're gonna be speaking in most of the time and then frame based on that. Don't set up your framing and then lean back in your chair for the next hour, defeats the purpose, right? Audio, make sure you're close enough certainly to the mic so people can hear you easily. Close the door, turn off your phone and any other alarms that are gonna happen. If you're too far from that camera and that mic, certainly people are gonna have trouble hearing you, but also you're gonna get some bouncing around, some echo as your voice bounces all over the room. And then do not move the camera or the phone, whatever you're using. Uh, don't walk around the room shooting this video selfie with the, with the background all blurry. I, I saw this on a late night talk show once they, they, they went back to the, the virtual presentation and one of the hosts was talking to a guest and she was walking all around her house, probably not that quickly, but the, the camera picks up all this movement as just this blur and it was almost nauseating. So lock it down, sit still and focus on your subject and, your, and the people you're talking to. And then pre and post communication. Uh, certainly contact the person, this is old school, contact the person you're going to interview with or you're going to present to the day before via email. That's great. Hey, are we still on? Is the time still good? Or anybody, anybody new coming to the presentation? Is, is somebody not going to be there? Any other things that have changed? Good time to find all that stuff out. And then after your presentation, this is a big one for me, always send a handwritten thank you note. Why would you do that? Why would you bother when you have email? Sending a handwritten note shows that you, you go above and beyond. It shows that you're attentive to detail. It shows that you appreciate the value and the time that somebody put into meeting with you, to interviewing you. And when you send that card, it, there's a chance it could sit on somebody's desk for a while, or it might be pinned to a, a bulletin board. We have a whole book of these things at our place. Our back bulletin board is filled with thank you cards. I've got my own book of thank you cards. People hold on to these things, they appreciate them. And when you have cards made, let's say, that are, are custom to your brand or your name or your picture, whatever it is you wanna put in the front, there's a, a visual reminder of what a good person you are and how much that person enjoyed the interview. Send that card immediately after the interview and, and do it consistently. You will not regret the small investment of having your own cards made, it's very important. All right. I wanna discuss the survey results. Again, I sent out three questions about a week or so ago and asked you to fill some of those out. Appreciate those of you who uh, took the time to fill those out. Thank you very much. I'm gonna read a few of the responses to these questions and, and give you a, a take on it. First question was, what is your number one fear or concern about presenting your work or yourself online? And two people answered, relying on tech factors like signal reliability, picture, audio clarity. And somebody else answered, technical issues and making sure to look good. Using a tool like Zoom or any other virtual presenting tools, uh, I gotta believe it's gonna get much easier uh, as we do it more frequently and the technology will get better and the, we'll be able to present ourselves more effectively and efficiently as, as time goes on. When I first got here to this agency, this is again in 19, uh, 1993, I had never really used a computer. Uh, I was in radio, didn't have a need for it there, but uh, so I, I got here and I literally could not fathom typing copy, writing copy via keyboard. So when I had to write scripts, I would get out a legal pad, write it freehand, write everything that I wanted to write, get it just the way I wanted it, and then transfer that into the keyboard. There was some disconnect where I couldn't do this. And my boss would laugh at me, he still loves the story to, to this day. And finally he said, look, dude, you gotta, you gotta learn how to do this. So it was a, a comfort factor that I had to, to get used to. And finally I do it. And now I type up to seven words a minute. So I, I couldn't be more proud. But anyway, using the tool, I think will get easier and it'll, it'll become more effective for everybody. Sometimes we have those, those uh, variables that we can't control and technical problems are certainly one of those. That's why, again, you wanna make sure that your, your content and your presentation is as strong as it can be. 
Uh, another answer to that question of what is your number one fear, two people said, or three people, excuse me, said theft of content followed by unwarranted criticism. And someone said, someone stealing their content. And the third person said, harsh criticism of their content. So let's address theft of your content. I think that's, that's part of the expectation these days. It's one of the reasons newspapers can't survive. People are not willing to pay for that content as much as they used to be. So you've got to be prepared to give some of that content away. It could be a blog post, or white papers, how-to videos, social content, certainly. You need to get comfortable with that idea that you're, people have an expectation that they're going to get stuff for free here. But the content you use, though, is your marketing. Use it to demonstrate your philosophies and how you solve problems and what you would do in this case. And you're just teasing people. You're giving them samples of what kind of person you'll be to work with once they hire you based on those samples. And then the idea of people criticizing your content. There's no getting around it. Criticism stings and uh, it, it can be hard to take. But let me reframe this a little bit. If you owned a restaurant, would you want to know that the people who order your lasagna hate your lasagna because it's too salty or because the sauce is too runny? If you owned a restaurant, would you want to know that people are put off by your rude hostess? If you had a restaurant, would you want to know that people are kind of disgusted by your filthy restrooms? Would you want to know those things? And the answer is, you'd better want to know them, of course. That's free advice. Those are people saying you have a weakness here. And yes, sometimes you're going to get trolls and you're going to get people who are, have some kind of personal vendetta. Okay, fine, whatever. It's easy enough to weed those folks out. But when you start seeing patterns, wow, eight out of 10 people hate our lasagna. That's a problem. And they're telling you that. They're, you're, they're giving you that information. You need to accept that and get better from it. Negative reviews are a blessing if you take them the right way. Try to realize that you can derive a lot of benefit from those comments. When you see those kind of things, analyze the information. See again if there's a pattern of similar events. Everybody says that I can't do this. Well, then you probably can't do that. Learn how to do it better if it's important to you. And then get to work on fixing that problem. The second question that I asked was, uh, what have you done to differentiate yourself or your work online or in a Zoom meeting? And here are the answers that I pulled. Um, I try to convey my passion everywhere. That's a big part of who I am and what fuels my work. Love that. Professionalism and making sure the camera is not showing half of the ceiling. I try to present my work on multiple platforms. Good idea. Not everybody is on this channel or that channel, so that's a good idea. And then ask questions. That's the fourth answer. And I want to address the idea of asking questions because it's, it's key to what we do here at Mad Ave Group. Not only does asking questions provide for you the answers that you uh, know you need or know you want, it can also give you a wealth of information that you never expected. Never underestimate the tremendous value of asking an open-ended question and then shutting up. Embrace the silence. Let somebody think about that answer and they will start giving you things that you never never expected. Feelings and emotions as well sometimes. Sometimes it's the root of their problem or the, the root of what they need your help for. So also asking questions just shows people that you care and that you're interested in the topic that you're sharing right now. And it just plain makes you smarter. So always ask questions. And our third question, how do you typically follow up with an interviewer or a potential customer? And nearly everyone who answered this said they follow up with an email following the meeting the, the next day. All that's great, but please remember the importance and the value of that handwritten card. Make the effort. Go buy your cards right now. S stick them next to your, on your desk, whatever, where they're easily accessible, and write them freely and liberally. Thank people. Congratulate people. Do it with a, uh, with a card. Nobody does that. So you will stand out if, if for no other reason, just because you did it. And then hopefully it'll help you uh, strengthen relationships too and create nice feelings when you, when you do something like that. All of that said, all, all, everything I've just said is one thing, but Zoom and similar tools are not always appropriate for the situation. Uh, I wrote a blog post for our business voice agency a while ago, and I'd like to read a, an abridged version to you. 
Did you see the video of poor Jennifer, the woman who was caught using the bathroom while on a video conference for work? She forgot to turn off her laptop's camera while um, taking care of a different sort of business as her colleagues looked on. Admittedly, that specific issue is not likely to occur too often, but a, a general lack of privacy is one of the potential drawbacks with video conferencing. For example, people using streaming video to join meetings could unintentionally expose sensitive information on neighboring computer screens or whiteboards. What if a few of your staff members are, okay, I'll say it, slobs? Do you really want clients to associate your employees' messy or disorganized homes with your brand and the service those clients are paying top dollar for? Some workers may encounter technical challenges with video conferencing due to a lack of broadband internet at their home. And let's face it, watching a lot of people on a screen at once can be distracting. So you want people in your meeting to focus? Consider using the conference call feature of your telephone. For years, you've likely heard people wonder about the need for meetings. They say, can't we just take care of this with an email? Consider asking a similar question about gathering via video conferencing Will there be anything attendees actually need to see during this meeting? Just because the tool exists doesn't mean it's right for every application. Rethink, in this case, the telephone as perfectly appropriate technology for getting everyday business done. And I should mention that Business Voice is, a, is an agency that specializes in on-hold marketing and telephone applications. So we have a, certainly an interest in, in telephones. So weigh all those things as you consider, uh, do I want to, to present via Zoom or some other similar tool, or can we do a phone call? Um, there are other ways. So to wrap up, I wanted to recap the 10 ideas that we talked about here today. And again, I'm going to have these sent to you so you can uh, check them out if you're interested. The 10 ideas to keep in mind when presenting yourself and your work virtually. Number one, what are your goals for the presentation? Remember those sub goals too. How do you want to be perceived? All those things. Learn about your audience prior to your interview or presentation. Do a little research. Number three, the importance of keeping up your energy. Number four, prepare questions for your interviewer. Number five, be ready to tell true stories about yourself and your work. Stories that are going to reinforce for people why they should hire you or buy from you. Number six, the presentation checklist. Things like make sure you have an uncluttered background, light and frame yourself well, stay close to the mic, that, that list. Number seven, handwritten card to follow up. Not two weeks from now, today, right away, as soon as the interview is done, so your contact is more likely to remember you. Eight, be prepared to give away content to show people what, uh, what you can do and, and use that as your marketing. Actively think of it as marketing content. Number nine, embrace criticism and use it to get better. That's a tough one, but it's, if you can master that, that's, that's pretty cool. Put your ego aside as much as you can. Embrace what people are telling you and use it to improve. And finally, number 10, don't be afraid to ask questions. I tell this to my kids all the time. I tell it to as many people as I can. Asking questions is how smart people get smart. There's nothing to be fearful or embarrassed about by asking questions. I, I got to believe that when, when you say, excuse me, I've never heard that phrase before. What does that mean? Or can you tell me more about that? I'm not familiar with that idea. People respect that. It's not even courageous when you think about it. It's just a smart thing to do. Ask questions as you go throughout life, not just in a situation like this, a Zoom thing. A lot of information out there, and it's yours for the taking if you want to ask about it. So thanks very much. Again, I sent a uh, follow-up information sheet to Denise early this morning. It's got some links. It's got the link to the uh, video in case you want to hear that a little bit better. And uh, hopefully she'll forward that to the instructors who will forward it to the, the students. And I've got my, uh, my emails on there. Please reach out if I can help with anything. Be happy to. And I guess that's about it. Anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts or uh, tell us how you're doing things these days in terms of presentations or interviews or have you had any recent experiences or? Um, we have two uh, brilliant professors here, not, not including me, who I wouldn't be surprised if they have some thoughts or observations. Uh, Mr. Thomas, what do you got for us? I like the, uh, the aspect that you shared uh, when it comes to your presentation, really, that you are telling a story, a story about yourself. Yeah, that's, that's certainly been a, a, a buzzword uh, in the marketing world uh, the last few years. Uh, uh, but as we've talked about in, in other presentations, I mean, stories just make it easier for your audience to remember your content. It's not necessarily a bunch of facts and figures. It's, um, 
It's something probably that they can relate to more. Oh, I've had that experience. I can remember we talked about commonalities. I, I, I get that. I can relate to that. And that's something that stories allow us to do. I mean, from the beginning of time, uh, before technology, we sat around the, the fire and sat around the cave and told stories like this. So whenever you can weave those uh, ideas uh, and themes into your presentation, great. I've, I've talked about this before. One of the reasons for the success of the American Idol show from the beginning was the idea that in a way it's telling stories. At the, I think towards the end, they start going back to the hometowns of the contestants and they tell a more sort of obvious story. But uh, the, the theme of a lot of those contestants and those winners is that rags to riches thing. They, they were born in a small town and now they're in Hollywood. So it's a, it's a very common theme that we've seen in the movies forever. It's, it's, we can all identify with that. We want to rise from where we are to where we could be. Uh, so that they've very successfully integrated that theme and that story type into their program. And that's one of the reasons that that show, I believe, succeeded for so long. But I've been wrong before. So any other thoughts? Anybody else have any uh, recent experiences with this, this channel or this tool? I, I have a question. Uh, one of the things that uh, when I talk to students about getting the job, presenting yourself well, we always try to talk about networking because that's such a, a, that can be so helpful and such a big thing. Any thoughts on uh, how to capitalize on networking or what you might do to encourage a network contact? Well, I, I think sometimes students don't understand that the person standing next to you in line at the pizza parlor might end up being somebody you can network with if you chat with them. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts. Absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you phrased it that way because uh, I'm certainly not known for my networking skills. And in fact, um, uh, probably two, three years ago, I, I gave a presentation at Denise's invitation about, about networking. Uh, and I, I likened it to, um, to some of the things I do with advertising and marketing. There are a lot of commonalities there. But and again, going back to my kids, my kids think I'm goofy when I do this. And I do this all the time because I have a genuine interest. We will go into a store, a small a local shop or something. And I always ask, how's business? How you doing? And not just during COVID, all the time. Or I'll ask some question about the business. I have a genuine interest in what people do and uh, how they do it and what they're going through. And for no other reason than I just want to know. Uh, oh, I happen to be in marketing and I can apply that information. If I can help you out, great. But that never enters into the conversation. I just want to know. And if you bring that inquisitiveness and that, that uh, genuine interest in people, into your life, all aspects, whether you are at the pizza parlor or you're in a more professional situation. I don't know how that can't begin to develop a network for you. Um, you can choose to pursue those little moments that you have and follow up and give a business card or, or however you want to do it. But I think um, it has to begin with a genuine interest. Does anybody else have something else to share or ask? I would like to throw out another question, uh, and it's one that I'm struggling with, and that is uh, approaching a job generationally. And by that, what I mean is my generation has a certain expectation as to how they perceive a potential employee when you come for a job interview. But I'm not quite sure how a younger generation might perceive that same individual. What are your thoughts regarding that? That may go, uh, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I have to paint with a broad brush here. I'm gonna make some uh, generalizations. I would imagine that goes one way more than both ways. In other words, the older generation, and I'm 57, may look more negatively on people who approach these situations lazily or carelessly or informally, I would look at that and go, wow, you couldn't put on a pair of pants? Wow, you couldn't show up on time? Wow, you couldn't come prepared? Maybe a younger generation, again, I, I, I'm sorry to generalize, but I'm, I'm going to for the argument here, might perceive those things as not as important, or they might not understand why somebody would not hire them because of those things. So it's certainly frustrating from, from my generation standpoint to, and we've had this conversation a few times, why can't you people do this? Why can't you 20 year olds do this? You know what I mean? Or, or whatever. So maybe the, um, 
advice is to the younger folks to say, hey, look, these standards or these practices were and still are important to the people you may be interviewing with. So aim a little bit higher maybe than you, than you naturally might be inclined to. Put on the tie, show up 10 minutes early, follow up with a card, contact the, the, the person before with an email. All of this shows that you're actively engaged with this interview process, that you're anticipating it, you're looking forward to it, you're prepared for it, and afterwards, thank you very much for it. All these things say to the employer, the interviewer, this is important to me, and I want to present that notion to you that this, this moment is important to me, and I want you to feel that. And as one of the uh, professors said, your soft skills are far more important than what you learned in college or the, 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 the skill set you have now. That skill set will develop. If it doesn't, you've got a bigger problem than not finding a job. But over your 20, 30, 40 years of working, your skills will develop, they will improve, they will expand, all those things. But if you're a jerk, that's probably going to stick with you your whole life. If you don't know how to communicate with people, if you don't know how to say thank you, look somebody in the eye, shake a hand and say, this is, I appreciate this moment, I appreciate your time, that wears on some people. So I, my advice is to the younger folks to say, do more than you think you need to or you think you ought to. I've gotten uh, requests for jobs via Facebook. I, I just can't, I can't figure that out. Hey, you guys hiring? Not you. And I just, I, I just ignore it. I can't. Uh, that's the effort you put in. Hey, you guys hiring? Sorry. That may be old fashioned. That may be an old guy talking at you, but I would much rather if I were 22 looking for my first gig, I'd much rather err on the side of doing things in a more formal way than being kind of uh, informal about it. I hope that helps, Rob. I don't, I don't know if that's uh, close to what you're looking for, but. Well, I, I think uh, you, you may have even touched on it a little bit earlier too, when you talked about in the presentation, professionalism. You know, how do you come across to those that you're, you're reaching out to? Right. It's, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but um, it feels to me a lot of times that the people looking for the job don't understand, and I understand that they wouldn't, but they don't comprehend that this process, this interviewing and hiring process, it's a big deal to us too. Just because we have a building and a company, a lot of employees, and we do stuff and we get paid, doesn't mean that finding employees constantly isn't a painful process. It is. If you're going to take this gig for the only the six months until you get something better, well, I'm really not interested in that. I'm, I'm trying to find people who want to be here specifically, not just those who want a, a job. I want you to love what we do, love the environment that we're in, love the culture, appreciate it and go, here's why I want to be here. And I will do what it takes to be here because you people are special or you people are unique. I love the product that you make, whatever it is. It's a two-way street for both uh, the people hiring and the people being hired. Appreciate what role the other person has and appreciate what they're investing into this process. So if you're looking for a job right now or will be shortly, believe me, the, those people on the other side of the camera or the desk are in pain or agony through this process too. So be sensitive to that and, and, and uh, give them your best. Scott, there is a question in the chat here. And it, I will read it to you. Okay. Any tips for people not comfortable on sharing about one's self? Well, um, I, I'm not sure what, what I, I'll assume that they don't mean personal information. I mean, I'm not going to give you my social security number here, but I, I would like to know what, what specifically maybe they're uncomfortable with. Um, is it just the idea of, in this case, being on camera? Or what would they be? What was, what's the nature of what they would be uncomfortable with? Any any feedback on that? Or yeah, that was my question. I I guess I don't find myself that interesting. So trying to appear um, as best as I can in front of a a potential employee, how to like I'm not comfortable really like selling myself in the uh-huh. sense of making myself look noteworthy. Yeah. I'll tell you, my son is the same way. My son is, a, is, is 21, and he, uh, <laughs> he's a brilliant kid. He's a very smart guy and a very unique personality. When I talk to him about, and I've talked to him for years about this, collecting 
testimonials from places he's worked or people he's known. And he's very reluctant to do that. I said, buddy, these are so valuable. We talk about as a brand, as a company here, as much as you can, let your customers talk about you. Nobody necessarily believes when you say, we're a great company. We do the best at everything. We're tremendous. Everybody's knows enough to filter through that stuff. But when all your clients say those things, all your customers you have for 25 years say those things, now that carries some weight, okay? So maybe you let your colleagues speak for you, you let your uh, former employer speak for you, you could do it that way. You could tell those stories, you could, you could almost assume a character or assume a role. You're, you're a storyteller, if your work doesn't lend itself to stories, perhaps. I, I, I'm sure we could figure out some way to make that happen for you. But are you just a facts and figures person? Are you, you just let, the, let the facts and figures speak for you. Um, not that you're not going to have to you know, talk to somebody eventually. Um, and it's okay to have a soft sell, certainly. Again, back to that comment about the soft skills. If you're a braggy kind of jerk, nobody wants to be around you. So you may be a great salesperson, but if nobody can tolerate you, you're probably not going to get the gig or you're going to be on the road somewhere where nobody has to deal with you. So if you're a, a kind person, a giving person, a team player, all those good words and phrases we throw around, if you're that kind of person who can also, by the way, do the work, then you're more likely to, to land that gig or get the next interview or whatever. So find if, you, if you're not necessarily comfortable standing in front of a camera and presenting yourself formally, do it other ways. I think we talked about a website, a portfolio, um, uh, what, what is it that you do specifically or you're trying to do is, can you answer that or? Well, I'm getting certificates on uh, bookkeeping, payroll and QuickBook. Okay. Have you had any uh, prior experience in that, in that, in that environment? Have you worked in that world before? No, I've been a delivery driver and a pharmaceutical clerk at a local pharmacy. Okay. What are, what are, can you think of some of the uh, characteristics or qualities that you exhibited in your previous work? How might those apply to the work that you want to do? Find a way to say that you, that you did above, you went above and beyond, you know, all the time. Or you, how, did you get any kind of promotions, any awards, any type of recognition? What would your former employer say about you? Let them speak for you. Again, because those of us who look at resumes always have to take them with a bag of salt because it's you talking about you. That's why I always encourage people to write, weave testimonials from former bosses or clients into their resume or their cover letter, however they wanna do it. Don't make me search for those things. Those are the things I care about. I wanna see how other people talk about you, how, how easy you are to work with on a team, how quickly you meet deadlines, how you go above and beyond. What do you like in the soft skills department? Let other people speak for you. So. Again, if I haven't made it clear, always be collecting those things. Wasn't planning on talking about this, but this might be an approach for you. See, a couple decades ago by now, uh, I was still working in radio and I was thinking about moving from uh, Toledo to Chicago. Loved the city, wanted to be there. Uh, so in preparation for that, I asked former program directors, production directors, um, other people who I'd worked with over the years, if they could write a letter for me, just a, a recommendation letter. I said, if you can do it honestly, I don't want you fudging anything. If you can do, if you can speak honestly in a good way, I would appreciate anything you might come up with. Thanks, left it at that. Within a week or two, I had, I don't know, eight or 10 letters from the people I had contacted. And I was amazed and very happy to see that every one of them, without my urging, wrote about Scott's sense of humor, production skills, and writing. Every one of them. So not only is that nice for me to see and be affirmed that way, those are the things I value. So it was nice to see that other people recognize those skills or abilities too. That was great. But the other thing that I got out of it is, now I have a marketing hook or an angle or a statement that I can hang my hat on. I always thought I like these things. I think I'm okay at these things. But now eight or 10 people said, you are great at one, two, three, down the row. Three things, that is the truth from eight separate people writing on eight separate occasions and that solidified my personal brand for me. 
So now I can go and I can lead with those kind of ideas. So in a resume or a cover letter or a online post or a website, whatever I can say, sense of humor, production skills, writing, those, that's what I do. And here are, by the way, comments from people that I've done it for who are very happy. It's not me telling you, it's these people. And here are samples of my work and you either like it or you don't, but these are the skills I'm leading with determined by this audience. And now I've got something that's legitimate. I didn't make it up. It's legitimate. So do that for your work and you can go forward confidently promoting yourself that way via the words of other people. And add something to what Scott said and, and it, but post to Olivia. If you notice the examples that you gave were from your world, radio, what are the skills that make me succeed? I'm an academic. I was in professional work for a decade and then I went right into academia. One of the things that you may have, Olivia, are several teachers who are teaching you information that will help you succeed in a field that you don't have a lot of experience in yet. You're just learning it. I would pick the ones that you think are, are the most approachable and contact them either virtually or in person and say, can I sit down and talk with you for just 15 minutes, pick your brain about what you would look for if you were hiring someone in this field so I can make sure those are the skills I sharpen or surprise, they may be the ones I already have. I just didn't realize they were so important. So use, use the people you have around you. And in this case, it would be your teachers. I, I have students who do that all the time. They come in, well, not anymore. They don't come in. Now they just contact me virtually, but they used to come in and sit in the office and just say, this is what I wanna do. I don't know how to get there. And, and sometimes I don't have an answer for them, but maybe we can brainstorm. Your teachers will have the answers on some of the skills that you may already possess or you're learning. And those are the things you want to take what you were just told about. I asked people to tell me what I do well. My God, I'm looking at the three things I need to do well for my next, my next success. So don't, don't let that slide by. Go ahead and, and talk to them while they're still available. You know, you have that nexus with them now. If I can add to that, that's a great idea. And you can even t take that approach uh, a little bit broader. Identify the a company that you might like to work for or several companies and go buy the CEO lunch. Go buy the marketing director lunch. It'll be the best money you ever spend. You get to get a, a half an hour or an hour with somebody who's working in the world that you want to work in. Oh my gosh. I, I know this happened to me probably five, 10 years ago. Uh, I think a lot of people reach a certain age and if they didn't already feel this way, they start to feel like they want to give back. I want to give more than I'm getting. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of people will be anxious to, to, to talk with kids over lunch or whatever, go out for coffee or whatever it is, and, and just listen to their stories. And you'll get a whole different approach, I would imagine, than you would get in a, an academic setting. You'll get a whole different take on things. And then do that as often as you can. I used to tell my, <laughs> I told my kids one time, I want this to be your summer job. I, I told this to my son. Um, once a week, I want you to go to a local business, doesn't matter what it is, the dry cleaner, the guy who owns the bowling alley, the restaurant owner, whatever, whatever it is, take him to lunch, I'll pay for it, I don't care. And talk about business, talk about his path, talk about his marketing, talk about everything that goes into what he does. Now, yes, I know you don't want to own a dry cleaner, or you don't want to run a bowling alley, but you will get lessons from those people that you never got in school at any level. They're in it, doing it real world. They'll tell you about their struggles, their pains, their joys. And you'll come away with, again, in a cumulative sense, a better picture of what it is to survive in this world, what it is to succeed, to, to run a business. And, and then you can apply those lessons, I'm confident, to anything you do. They're not industry specific. So I would always encourage people to be willing to sit down or invite people to a lunch Sometimes networking or, or, or formal networking situations can be uncomfortable. They are for me. You don't want to interrupt people or it's hard to walk into a room where people are, you know, all that stuff. But if you send an email to a local guy and said, hey, could I buy a lunch? I just want you to tell me your stories. And I, would, I bet you will be surprised by how many people take you up on that or are flattered by the invitation. Look, we, it's human nature. We're, we're flattered by somebody who asks us for our opinion or, you know, what, they want to hear what our stories are. So capitalize on that, uh, on that tendency that we have to say, yeah, I'll tell you my story. Did your son do it, Scott? 
Uh, no, because I'm not a very good parent. So I wasn't persuasive enough. But, uh, uh, but I still think I still think it's a good idea, and I would recommend it to anybody as I am now, because I think uh, there's a lot of, as we've said, a lot of stories out there, and it, it's something I tell voiceover people when they come to me and ask about that that process and that career. I say I'm just one guy. I'll, I'll tell you what I think. What I'm encouraging you to do is go to the producer down the road and the guy who owns the studio next door and, the, and this guy and this guy and this guy. Get a bunch of opinions about your demo tape, for instance, or your talent, your abilities, and you'll find, or, or the business in general, and you will find out of all those people you talk about, talk to, you will find commonalities that, that drift to the top. And those are the true things that maybe are the most important or the things that you choose to grab onto and drive your career in this position or that direction based on these truths. So yeah, yak it up, talk to people and, and get their insight. Scott, we really appreciate your generous time. Um, and, and I will share the document that you sent me this morning with um, the students. Uh, I'll share it with the teachers and to, for them to share with the students and also some of my colleagues who came who are not in classes. And um, you may get some emails from people, I don't know, but <laughs> we, we really, oh my gosh, this was so amazing and we really appreciate it. And thanks to your tech person who did a beautiful job. Corey Brown, the guy, that's the guy's name. And I put Corey's uh, uh, website on that list as well. So right. please go out and check out his work. He's, he's done some wonderful things and uh, he's only getting started. So it's, it's exciting. Well, thank you so much, and, and we wish you a very safe weekend with the holiday, and I'm wishing that to anybody who's still here, and uh, thank you so much. I, I took five pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, again, I appreciate the invite, and you're, and you're always so kind, Denise, and um, uh, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. So let me know how I can help in the future, and I, I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. Make the best of it, and love to you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Take good care. Bye. Be safe and enjoy Turkey Day. Bye, Dr. Pratt. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. This was so good. Nicely done. Yes, I agree with you. Bye, guys. Have a good Thanksgiving. Bye now.